There are few names in sports as recognizable as basketball legend Michael Jordan. I mean, even if you know nothing about sports, you've probably heard of the guy. Not only is he one of, if not the greatest athlete of all time, he's a spokesman for dozens of different brands, he's a billionaire businessman, and most importantly, he's a meme. I mean, really, is there anything that this guy can't do? Well, yeah, it's called acting. Has anyone here ever played basketball? Oof, it's almost like this guy's a professional athlete and not an actor. I really enjoy Enjoy playing with you guys. You guys got a lot of uh, well, whatever it is, you got a lot of it. Let's just hope that LeBron had a better acting coach for the sequel. <laughs> Hello Internet, welcome to Film Theory, the show that always asks, y'all ready for this? And by this, we mean lengthy analytical deep dives into movies you loved when you were in elementary school. My dear theorists, it should come as no surprise to those of you who know me well that I wasn't exactly the sportiest of children growing up in the 90s. They just weren't as interesting to me as video games, or movies, or math, or Phantom of the Opera. You all laugh, but that Phantom's got himself some mad ups. No, in all honesty, pretty much everything was more exciting to me than watching in the old sports ball. But there was one notable exception, the cinematic masterpiece known as Space Jam. Combining cartoons with one of the most popular athletes on the planet, talk about a slam dunk. Now, the plot isn't exactly the most important thing, but if it's been a while, here's the original Space Jam story in less than 30 seconds. Some small aliens get sent to Earth to abduct the Looney Tunes and take them back to their alien theme park planet. Bugs Bunny, obviously not wanting to be abducted, notices that the aliens are small and challenges them to a basketball game in exchange for their freedom. Good plan, except for one thing. The aliens steal the talent from five professional basketball players on Earth to turn themselves into the ultimate basketball team, the Monstars. With their freedom on the line, the Looney Tunes kidnap Michael Jordan to help him win, and after a hard-fought, poorly officiated game, the Toon Squad comes out on top. Also, Bill Murray shows up randomly, which might be the most realistic part of the movie. Adia dee dee that's all, folks. This movie single-handedly got me interested in basketball. Sure, I might get picked last in gym class, but if Elmer Fudd can dunk one, how hopeless can I be? I'll let Sniffles the Mouse sum up my playing philosophy. I'm small, but I'll try really, really hard to be good okay. at basketball. And I always try hard. My mom says try your best in everything you do. Sure, the movie might not have taken home an Oscar, but it won something better. $1.2 billion in merchandising revenue. So you can kind of see why a sequel was inevitable starring the new Michael Jordan, aka LeBron James. So yeah, gotta say, kinda hype for Space Jam New Legacy. Now, I haven't seen the movie yet, so I don't know a whole heck of a lot about the team that LeBron has to face other than they look like rejected aliens from Men in Black. But I gotta say, these guys have got themselves some huge shoes to fill. I mean, the Monstars in the original movie were an unstoppable team. Huge, intimidating, and harnessing the best talent that the NBA had to offer at the time. LeBron had better be thankful that he's not facing up against that, right? Well, no. Looking back on Space Jam, the Monstars were actually a team that was built to fail from the start. As scary as they were, I'm confident in saying that if the Monstars were to play in the NBA, these days, they'd finish dead last in their league. Don't believe me? Well, let's lace up those Air Jordans and pour yourself a tall glass of MJ's secret stuff, because it's time to come on and slam the Monstars as the crummy team that they were, and how they'd only be worse in this new movie if they were to return. Now, to really start talking about how good the Monstars weren't, we actually have to consider their individual players, or rather, the real NBA players that each alien stole their talent from. Obviously, the Monstars didn't precisely turn into the players whose talent they stole. To the best of my recollection, Patrick Ewing was incapable of breathing fire. But based on the original form of the aliens and their ignorance about what basketball even was, it's safe to say that the aliens didn't add any sort of basketball skill to the equation. So to simplify the argument, we're gonna say that the Toon Squad was essentially playing a game against the five players that the Monstars stole their basketball talent from. Individually, all five of these guys were good players, but together? Mm -hmm it's gonna make for a strange team. The typical positions on a basketball team are point guard, shooting guard, small forward, power forward, and center. And historically, teams have one player at each position playing at any given time. Guards tend to be smaller, faster, better shooters, and better ball handlers. Power forwards and centers are bigger and slower. They play closer to the basket to block shots, get rebounds, and score from close range. Now, the Monstars clearly valued their big guys, since four of the five players they mimic are either power forwards, Larry Johnson and Charles Barkley, or centers, Patrick Ewing and Sean Bradley. And the Monstars had no middle ground because their fifth player is Muggsy Bogues, the shortest man to ever play in the NBA at just five feet, three inches tall. So it's not a roster with a lot of balance, but hey, weren't those just the five best players in the league? Yeah, no. 
not exactly. Barkley and Ewing are Hall of Famers, sure, but in 1995 and 1996, the season that Space Jam takes place in, they'd both been pros for a decade and were well past their prime. As for the other three players, they're all better basketball players than I'll ever be, to be sure. But Sean Bradley, Muggsy Bogues, and Larry Johnson were named to the NBA All-Star team just two times combined in 36 years of playing professionally. The point is that the Monstars were a horrifically unbalanced team consisting of players who were far from the five best non-Jordan players at the time. And that's just talking about the era that the movie came out. I've seen a lot of people bummed out about the fact that the Monstars aren't returning for this new movie, but I gotta tell ya, they'd be a far worse team now because of the way NBA basketball has evolved over the past 25 years. In fact, if they did reprise their role in Space Jam New Legacy, they'd get blown out not just by LeBron James, but by even mediocre teams, because one, they're too slow on the defense, two, they'd tire out too easily, and three, they can't shoot. Let's take these one at a time, shall we? Issue one, the Monstars would be too slow to play modern NBA defense. A number of factors are crucial for playing good defensive basketball, but speed and quickness are arguably the two most important. If you can't keep up with the player on offense that you're supposed to guard, you're gonna be giving up easier shots when players go around you, and you'll have trouble recovering when the offense runs a play to exploit your lack of speed. The Monstars, despite being explosively strong, athletic, and creatively violent, aren't very quick. Now, speed and quickness can be hard to quantify, so we're turning to an old friend to do the job for us, video games. NBA Live 98 is the oldest NBA game with comprehensive ratings on player attributes, grading them between 50 and 99 on everything from awareness to dunking ability. The game was released about six months after Space Jam hit theaters, so it's a pretty good data set for us to use. Now, NBA Live 98 has some great things to say about Muggsy Bogues' speed and quickness, rating him at 82 and 97 respectively. For the other four players, though, their speed averaged out to 63.8, and their quickness was an anemic 52.8. Even if you exclude Sean Bradley, who at a whopping 7 feet 6 inches is one of the tallest but slowest players in NBA history, those numbers only jump to like 67.3 for speed and 58.7 for quickness. Still well below the average. So what would this mean for the Monstars in a typical game? Well, for one, it means that they would be awful at defending the fast break, where the opposing team gets a rebound and sprints to the other end of the court to score as quickly as possible. But even in a slower game, the lack of quickness would be problematic. Take, for example, one of the most popular actions in the NBA, the ball screen. In a ball screen, the offensive player with the ball leads the defender into a screen set by their teammate to get away from the defender. Then the teammate who sets the screen most commonly rolls to the basket, known as a pick and roll, leaving the ball handler without the option to pass, drive, or shoot. Without the foot speed to handle ball screens, switch defensive assignments, or defend against the fast break, the Monstars would be giving up tons of points no matter how many shots they block around the rim because they're playing against a much faster team, a team that's literally led by rabbits. Issue number two, the Monsters would get exhausted in every game they play. Another odd decision by the aliens was to only steal the talent from five players. NBA rosters typically have 13, though the past season it was expanded to 15, and it's exceedingly rare for fewer than eight to play in any individual game. So without any players on their bench, all five Monstars are forced to play the entire 48 minutes of the basketball game, which is far more than any of these players would typically play. Issue number three, they can't shoot. If you watch an NBA game these days, you'll notice how much work teams have put into getting open three-pointers. It wasn't always that way, though. The three-point line was introduced into the NBA in 1979, but it wasn't all that popular at first. Coaches hadn't factored it into their offensive strategy, and players hadn't grown up practicing it, so it took decades for it to become as popular and as effective as it is now. And while each of the Monstars had some elite skills, none of them were good three-point shooters. In the 2020-2021 NBA season, the average three-point shooting percentage for all players in the league was 36.7%. The year before Space Jam came out, only one Monstar, Larry Johnson, even approached that number, shooting 36.6%. Everyone else on the team is far below. Charles Barkley, 28%. Bradley, 25%. Muggsy Bogues, 20%. And Patrick Ewing shooting a ghastly 14.3%. And here's the thing, those numbers are actually inflated. Seeing just how unpopular the three-pointer was in the 80s and early 90s, the NBA actually moved the three-point line almost two feet closer to the basket for three years from 94 to 97. Factor that into the calculations, and the entire Monstars roster would shoot 25.4% from three. No single team in the NBA has shot that bad in this century. And it's not just the rate at which the Monstars would be shooting those threes that would hurt them. It's the sheer number of threes a modern opponent would be 
shooting against them. In the last year before Space Jam, with a standard three-point line, NBA teams only attempted 10 threes per game. Last year, they attempted 35. So even if the Monstars somehow didn't get tired and figured out how to defend in spite of their lack of quickness, the fact that even an average team in today's NBA scores much more efficiently means that the Monstars would get crushed over and over and over again. LeBron should hope that this mysterious goon squad in the new movie is exactly as good, or I should say not good, as the Monstars were. Now, maybe you're thinking that if the Monstars were really as bad as I'm saying they were, wouldn't Michael Jordan and the Toon Squad have blown them out of the water in the original movie? And it's certainly a reasonable thought, but go back and watch the movie again. When I watch the game again as an adult, I can't help but feel that it's been a bit rigged. I mean, come on, look at all the fouls that the referee isn't calling here. And remind me again, who was the referee? Oh yeah, Marvin the Martian. But Matt Pat, he's impartial because he's both Toon and Alien. You really expect me to believe that the Looney Tune whose primary objective in all his cartoons was to disintegrate other Looney Tunes and also blow up Earth wasn't pulling for the aliens? Tell him what I think about that, Logic MJ. Stop it. Get some help. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And you know, I've actually been doing a lot of binge watching and prep for this new Space Jam movie. Not only does it feature all our favorite delusional doodles, the Looney Tunes, but there are just a ton of cameos from a lot of other Warner Brothers classic characters. We're talking Scooby-Doo and the whole Mystery Incorporated team, Pennywise the Clown? Are, are those the Droogs from A Clockwork Orange? What? What I'm saying is that in order for me to be fully ready to comprehend the massiveness of this movie, I've got a lot of catching up to do. And luckily, today's sponsor, NordVPN, is here to help. Nord is the trusted online security solution used by over hundreds of thousands of internet users worldwide, myself included. Did you know that with a VPN like Nord, you're given access to streaming sites around the world? That's right, with NordVPN, you can get access to other countries' versions of your favorite streaming sites, giving you the ability to stream movies and shows that may not be available for you at home. With over 5,400 servers in 59 countries, you can essentially unlock a never-ending streaming library. NordVPN is literally the only reason I've been able to watch every season of RuPaul's Drag Race internationally. There's so many of them at this point. Australia, Thailand, UK. They're impossible to watch here in the US, but guess what? With NordVPN, just one click, boom, and suddenly my internet looks like it's coming from a completely different place where all those seasons are available to me to watch at home. What I love most about Nord is that it helps me stay safe on the internet. With NordVPN, your info stays safe behind a wall of next-generation encryption. It masks your IP so that you can keep your browsing to yourself. So let's just say you're studying the fine nuances of Lola Bunny's redesign for research. No one will have the ability to track that data. Not even Nord. With their strict no logs policy, they don't track, collect, or share your private data. Your business stays and remains your business. So get Nord today and also help support this channel by clicking the link below in the description or going to nordvpn.com slash film theory. That's F-I-L-M-T-H-E-O-R-Y. Use the code Film Theory to get yourself a two-year plan at a huge discount plus a free bonus. It's all risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. Again, that's nordvpn.com slash film theory and use the offer code Film Theory at checkout to take advantage of Nord's worldwide servers and ensure your privacy online. And cut.